from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is U.S. Farm Report. Welcome to U.S. Farm Report this St. Patrick's Day weekend. I'm Tyne Morgan, and here's what's in store over the next 60 minutes. Autonomy in ag is on a roll. So is smart farming. Well, the term smart farming can mean a lot of different things, but I'll tell you what it will mean. It will mean better operational efficiency for all farmers and a more sustainable message for society in general. How it's shaping trends in the equipment world. A new way to cash in on carbon. I believe in five years time, almost every product that we buy, especially food wise, will have a CI score affixed to it. What farmers can do now to prepare, capturing an entirely new revenue stream. Plus, we're taking you inside a robotic dairy. Robots pushing up the feed, uh, automatic scraper scraping the manure. We try to use as much automation in this barn as we can. And a slew of export cancellations from China. What crop is being hit the hardest? The answer coming up. U.S. Farm Report, presented by Pioneer. What's next happens when blood, sweat, and tears meet rain, wind, and sun. Pioneer, what's next happens here. Now for the news, a big announcement from USDA with regards to product of the USA labeling. The Ag Secretary detailing a new policy mandating all meat products sold with that label must be derived from animals born, raised, slaughtered, and processed in the U.S. Tom Vilsack making the announcement at this year's National Farmers Union Convention in Scottsdale, Arizona. The agency says the final rule allows the voluntary product of USA or made in the USA label claim to be used on meat, poultry, and egg products. The rule would prohibit misleading U.S. origin labeling in the market. Vilsack saying the rule is a response to thousands of comments from stakeholders as well as a consumer survey. The reason for this is quite simple. Um, we, we, surveyed, we surveyed consumers. We, we asked them the question, when you see this label, what do you think it means? I said, well, what do you, what do you mean? What do, what it means it was, everything was done in the United States. Well, actually, that's not been the case. Then we asked the question, do you place a value on that? I mean, in other words, are you willing to pay a nickel or two more if that is on the list? Well, absolutely. We want to help our farmers. So in order for that value proposition to be respected, in order for there to be fairness and honesty and a proper representation in the marketplace, it's important to have rules like this. The requirements don't take effect until January 1st of 2026. In the meantime, both U.S. and foreign trade associations in countries like Canada and Mexico are trying to determine what it means for the industry. However, legal and other challenges are expected. And NCBA officials telling us they're pleased the label is voluntary, but they have many questions and aren't sure if the born and raised language will create premiums or if retailers will eventually decide not to use the label. Tyson announcing this week it's shutting down another plant, this time a pork plant in the town of Perry, Iowa. It means a loss of more than 1,200 jobs. The plant is the largest employer in Perry. The plant, which processes about 9,000 hogs a day, has operated for about 60 years. It's set to close on June 28th. Tyson saying in a statement the decision was not easy, but that it emphasizes its focus on optimizing the efficiency in its operations to best serve customers. Analyst Brad Coima finding that hard to buy. Maybe the packer sees tighter numbers coming. Uh, that's the first thing that comes to my mind, you know, if they dare to close a plant. I mean, let's face it, these hog packers have been making money since 1998 uh, when the industry became vertically integrated after those eight, nine cent hogs. Uh, I, I, you know, it's hard for me to have a lot of sympathy that they aren't able to make money. Tyson said it still employs 9,000 people in Iowa with pork facilities in Waterloo, Storm Lake, and Columbus Junction. Over the past year, Tyson has announced the closures of six U.S. chicken plants. And another announcement impacting Iowa, John Deere plans to lay off 150 employees in Ankeny. U.S. Farm Report affiliate KTVO reporting the cuts will impact about 150 workers. It says John Deere Des Moines Works confirmed employees were told about the layoffs at a meeting at the factory on Friday and that the workers will be placed on indefinite layoff effective over the months of April and May. The Ankeny plant currently employs about 1,700 people. And not good news, USDA announcing over three days Beijing canceled 18.5 million bushels of soft red winter wheat and analysts are telling us it may not in there. Market analysts tell us China may have pulled out of those sales because they can buy wheat at cheaper prices elsewhere in the world. 
especially with Russia, which is now offering wheat at under $200 per metric ton. However, it may also be a result of shipping problems along the Mississippi River and Panama Canal. I think they just wave the flag and they're going to give that back. They must, you know, um, I don't know if they're waiting to buy more cheaper or if they just kind of overshot the story last fall that their harvest got, you know, 20% ruined with the rain and it looked like they're going to make it through just fine. Dooling tells us he is expecting more China cancellations as they had bought another 36 million bushels of U.S. soft red winter wheat last fall and they still have about 22 million of that to ship. That's it for the news. Well, severe weather fired up across the country to end the week. What can we expect the second half of March? Your Farm Country forecast is next. U.S. Farm Report weather is brought to you by H&S Manufacturing. Maximize baleage yield with less time and effort with the LW1100 line wrap bale wrapper. You can wrap round or square bales and the automatic operating mode allows for a one person operation. Well, a powerful storm system buried Colorado under more than three feet of snow this week. That same system also spawned tornadoes across the central part of the U.S. Meteorologist Matt Engelbrecht joining us now with the weather. Matt, it looked like snow for some of our viewers because that same system hammered other areas with hail. But the silver lining, Matt, it did bring some rains across Kansas, Missouri and Iowa, you know, areas that really needed it. Yeah, that's exactly right. And in these kind of situations, what we want is just enough rain to avoid flooding and uh, enough rain to where we avoid severe weather. Now, going forward, what I want to show you is what's going to be happening with our temperatures between the 19th and the 23rd. This signal has been showing up since last week, so we can continue to hone in on that, which is below average temperatures back up here towards the Midwest and Northeast, as well as into the Dakotas with warmer than average average conditions back down to the south and to the southwest. Pretty normal back into the southeast. Now, depending on how far that cold air gets, I could be looking at a bit of a cold air outbreak, if you want to call it that, that is going to be moving from the north to the south. I want to show you that. This is a jet stream uh, into next week. Uh, three big features uh, that we're going to be following. Uh, the first two you can really easily see. It's this circle right here. Here's your cutoff low and this one right here. This is a uh, trough uh, that is going to be digging from the north to the south. The third one is right down here, this ridge. And we've talked about this before. The stronger the ridge is, uh, the less likely we'll see this cold air extend all the way down here to the south. And as I put this into motion, that's what you're going to see. Uh, that trough try and dig and get held up with the coldest air up here to the north. Now between the trough and the ridge, there is going to be a decent amount of rainfall Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday right along the Gulf Coast states as we pick up some of that moisture and bring in some of the rain. Uh, that uh, next system you know, could also bring some snowfall in across the Midwest, especially into the Northeast with a ridge building off to the West, which means we go mostly zonal by Wednesday, Thursday and Friday of next week. These lines go more from the left to the right rather than north and south. So you know, quiet pattern trying to set up in and across the United States as you go into next weekend, uh, Thursday, Friday and Saturday with again that zonal flow supporting some showers. This little shallow you right there could bring some showers back into the southeast, but this is a quiet pattern in the jet stream. Just not a lot of energy at the surface that's going to you know, transition or turn into strong thunderstorms in across the United States. So, so it's one of those situations where we could get some rain where we need it, but it's also looking like a pretty dry pattern uh, going into the weekend. Again, there's a jet stream coming up on Friday uh, with again some warmer temperatures on the way after a bit of a cold stint Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday of uh, this week. Thanks, Matt. Well, speaking of weather, could it be an early spring? It sure seems that way. We'll talk about what it could mean for acreage with Dwayne Bussey and Darren Fry next. Well, welcome back to U.S. Farm Report this weekend, Darren Fry, as well as Dwayne Bussey on the show with us. All right, let's talk about China. We mentioned it at news, but Darren, last week, China said it was stockpiling grains, building its reserves. And this week, more cancellations by China purchases of SRW wheat is it just wheat or, or what's going on? Well, I do think that they're uh, playing games with the market here, but they are good at that. And they are canceling some wheat, uh, probably stuff that they bought that they want to do better on as far as pricing. Uh, they also have canceled some cargoes of French wheat as well. I don't think this is the start of a lot of cancellations, but I think this is something that does hit the market, uh, does mess up uh, people's minds and emotions around it. 
And obviously they're trying to book things cheaper. So I don't think the market is going to have a lot more downside from here. It's digesting a lot of negative news around cheap FOD prices out of Russia. And as we turn the corner, we're going to be focused more on uh, Northern Hemisphere weather. And this could be scoring a bottom here with all this negative news. So uh, I'd be watching closely to see what action is coming out of this. Uh, not good news, obviously, but the market has taken it pretty well. Yeah, Dwayne, I mean, Darren mentioned it. The market is shaking off some of this negative news. Do you think it is signaling that a bottom is possibly in? I sure think so. I, we got to remember we have the funds already in these massive short positions. And, you know, we rebounded last week off of these cancellations really well, technically. You know, and I think China's just doing an economic thing like they always do. I, they can cancel these previous purchases and they could go out two weeks from now and buy it again here at these lower levels. So it just might be pure economics. Okay, at the same time, we did see soybeans rally a bit on some news that we're seeing some cuts to the Brazil soybean crop, Conab, Darren, lowering the projections by 2.5 million metric tons for soybeans, also lowering corn. But both of those estimates are well below USDA's current estimates that we just got last Friday, Darren. Yeah, that's right. Uh, USDA is quite a bit higher, about 8 million metric tons. They're quite a bit higher on corn as well for the Safrina crop and the total Brazilian corn crop. So uh, time will tell who's going to be closer to the mark. But I do think the beans were supported a little bit by that. And as well, last Friday, a week ago, we saw record uh, positions of short held by the funds. And so probably just a little bit uncomfortable given what's happening here technically uh, coming up against the 50-day moving average and uh, really almost a dollar off the bottom here in the May soybeans. And that probably has funds a little uneasy. Whether we can keep them short cover or not will depend on a lot of other factors. But this has been a good rally, and I would imagine it uncovers some farmer selling uh, from the old crop standpoint. Dwayne, is it a reminder that South America is not behind us? I mean, this is not old news. The fact that it did uh, trigger some action in the markets when we saw that cut come from Conab? Yeah, I, I think so. You know, I, I think it's a nice trade action we've had. I, I think we can confidently say that the lows are in. But to Darren's point, I don't know how much higher we can go on, on short covering alone with the farmer selling that's going to be out there. And Darren also mentioned the U.S. weather. You know, I think it's going to take a U.S. weather problem to really keep an upward trend going. We got maybe a little bit overbought earlier this week, and then that started another pullback here. We're probably range bound until we start really trading the uh, acreage report up here in the U.S. Well, speaking of acreage report this week, we did get a private uh, estimate out of Allendale. So we'll talk about that, plus um, some weather news and what's going on with the cattle market. Are the bulls, I mean, are we going to see more bullish action? What's going on with the funds? We'll do all of that when we come back on U.S. Farm Report. U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by Germinator Steel Closing Wheels. Perfected in conventional, excels in no-till. Order your Germinator closing wheels today. Welcome back, Darren Fry and Dwayne Bussey joining us. All right, Allendale's 2024 acreage survey results coming out. Uh, their survey showed corn. We're going to see that down 1.2 million acres from 2023 to 93.47 million. Soybeans up 2.2 million to 85.8 million. Darren, is that kind of in line with what you're thinking? Well, I was actually thinking we'd see a smaller corn number and a larger bean number, kind of like the outlook for them. But, you know, last year we had the same type of thinking and then the farmer came in with bigger corn acres, smaller bean acres. Farmers like to plant corn. And from a perspective of which one would make more money or lose less money, I think it is soybeans. We do a lot of financial analysis on accrual projections. And uh, I think the farmer is going to be better off planting some more beans, but they like planting corn. And maybe they're more optimistic of higher corn prices later versus bean prices being higher. So those numbers that we saw from Allendale, while startling at first, they might be closer to the mark than we think. Well, a lot of questions when it comes to the fringe acres. The way it just so happens you live there, you farm <laughs> there. When you look at North Dakota and South Dakota, it's been pretty mild. Talking about an early start to spring. What do you think? Yeah, exactly. A couple months ago, I was probably in that 4 million acre shift away from corn to soybeans, just like everyone else. I think that's where USDA came out as well. But I think Allendale's nailing it here. Driving in North Dakota and South Dakota last couple of weeks, there is zero snow. All the fall field work was done that everybody seems like they wanted to. It feels like ready to go. In fact, we're kind of holding everybody back from going out too early, which obviously it's way too early up here. So 
if that is the case, weather to me is always the largest driver of these fringe states up here as far as what gets planted. So I think Allendale's really correct by saying right now, as we intend, it's a little bit more corn acres than we thought. Yeah, and a, a lot like what we saw last year when we had that early spring and farmers just kept planting corn in some of those other states. All right, I know we're still assessing, Darren, the impact of the wildfires in Texas on the cattle market, but are the fundamentals bullish still for cattle? I, I think they are, and I think everybody knows uh, why they are. They're tight numbers. They're still good domestic demand. Uh, we have to see something ration some of that demand, and we're seeing that in the export market. But it's jittery up here. You know, one day you go into new highs, the next day you're coming back to support, and you're getting these reversals down and then back up again. And we're seeing the same type of trade throughout this past week. So uh, just a lot of consternation about being long up here at all-time highs. But I think fundamentally the market still can go higher. I think the cash has, has tried to, to come down as the packers have slowed the shackle speed up and tried to boost the beef and, and cut the cash and knock things back. But they haven't been successful. And I think uh, ultimately we're going to probably see things trend higher uh, into this uh, April, May timeframe as we see box beef uh, continue to move higher with demand showing up uh, at a normal seasonal. So I want to remain bullish for right now. It's really active in this cattle market right now. Darren mentioned new all-time highs. Are the funds buying, Dwayne? I don't think they are to the point I want them to. That's what kind of has me a little bit concerned this week. And like earlier in the week, I was sending you an email about how bullish I am in the cattle market. Then Thursday's trade action had me a little concerned. Um, you'll, if you look back at the charts, we had massive fund buying get us to highs. And then, of course, as they exited last year, that's when we came off. I don't think they're quite buying as much as I'd like to see. But Darren's right. The fundamentals are bullish. That is enough story to push us to higher prices now. But we need those funds to really come back in and they have to buy it as well. All right. To end things, I'm going to end, ask you both kind of what is your advice for farmers heading into spring planting? Uh, some already in the field, but those that are getting ready to hit the field. Dwayne, I'll, I'll start with you. What's your advice? Uh, I guess my advice has been kind of the same this winter, that it's very possible the great commodity bull run is over from the last couple of years. So we're back to hedging being a good thing. So make a marketing plan, have that in place, especially on this corn market. I'm a little bit nervous if we do increase the acres and we have a above trend yield, how ugly it could get come fall. So have a marketing plan in place as you get rolling. Darren, you're having a lot of conversations with farmers right now as well. What are you telling them? Yeah, it's kind of in line with what Dwayne said. You know, I do think that when we topped out back a year or so, year and a half ago, that is a good top for quite a while. But I do think rallies are possible. And those rallies could be a little bit bigger uh, than what we expect, just given weather challenges, uh, given what's going on with La Nina, uh, El Nino dropping off and maybe La Nina coming in in the middle of our growing season as we approach South America's next growing season. So there might be some opportunities here, but we're going to have some uh, rallies to sell and then maybe some breaks to reown and and maybe through some base hits, get a better value than what we can see today. But uh, I just think we're going to have a lot of opportunities to sell, but those rallies need to be sold as we move through summer. All right. Thank you both for joining us. I really appreciate it. We need to take a quick break, and then we're checking in with Machinery Pete for Tractor Tales. That's next. Hey, welcome back to Tractor Tales, folks. This week, we're going to head to Ohio to check out a pair of family-owned Cub Cadets. So we have two Cub Cadets I got in 97 on my brother's estate. January, freezing cold, I loaded these on trailers and with the rest of the stuff and brought them home. The one on, the, one on my left here is a 1200. It was bought as a leftover in about 81. He never really used it. He also had the 70. It's been repainted. I never went through the motor, but I've been through all their all been tore apart, painted, put all picked back together. We love taking this to shows. To a four-year-old, this is a big tractor. I have a mower deck for this one. This one still has this mower deck on it. He bought it in Moe's yard, but it only had a little posty stamp. It only ran a couple hours at a time, and if that, and he always had one of these, and this is the last one he had when he passed away, and so I acquired them, and this has been gone through, and I love taking this to shows. He had these two, and I knew he'd bought this one new, and I knew the history on it, and this one he'd bought somewhere, and so if he hadn't done that, I wouldn't have it. I'd only have the one. We had an original when I was a little kid that we'd broken half just from fatigue. And, and this was the next model up for that. Cub, in the lawn and garden tractor world knows that these are the ones they pull with, these, these Cub Cadets. This is a quiet line, part of the quiet line. The engine's rubber mounted, not supposed to shake so much. This thing is, they didn't really care. They just bolted it in and away you go. 
If you put a mower deck on that thing, it'll mow all day long. Here, your ears might not like it in the end, but. Thanks, Greg. Well, technology trends and equipment are racing forward, but autonomy in ag isn't all small driverless tractors like some had thought even a decade ago. It looks different depending on where you live. That's next. You're watching U.S. Farm Report. Trusted, timely, tradition. A decade ago, when talking about the future of farming, some thought we'd see smaller, driverless tractors on most farms or tiny robots planting and spraying the crops. While some of those forecasts have come true, it's much more about technology to helping farmers be even smarter across the U.S. This weekend, as we kick off our smart farming coverage, we show you how autonomy in ag is firing on all cylinders, but it looks different depending on where you live. Autonomy in agriculture is starting to roll on all cylinders across the U.S. From this fully autonomous New Holland tractor and grain cart powered by Raven Omni Drive Autonomous Technology to Kubota unveiling its vision for an autonomous future during CES this year. A transformation in ag equipment is unfolding right before our eyes. It couldn't be a more interesting and exciting time to be in the equipment industry because of all the new technology that has been released really within the last six months. Kurt Blades of the Association of Equipment Manufacturers, or AEM, says in the West, the focus is answering a major need, the shortage of labor. Harvesting a strawberry. A strawberry is a soft fruit that needs careful consideration. We've never been able to mechanically harvest a strawberry in an efficient way because we haven't had the technology, the artificial intelligence, the sensors to be able to detect whether it's the right shade of green, the right shade of red, and then also handle it with kid gloves. That's available now. And that's amazing how much different that technology is, is quickly exploding. In the Midwest, the autonomy trends look a bit different. Instead of smaller driverless equipment, major equipment manufacturers made a splash at recent shows with the largest horsepower combine and tractors yet, all with autonomous capabilities. We've been very clear that by 2030, we want to have a full production system for corn and soybeans that is fully autonomous. But you'll see us bringing out over the successive years more autonomy solutions in each of the steps across the production system. Aaron Wetzel is the VP of Production Systems for the Production and Precision Ag Business at John Deere. And in his 35 years with the company, he says he's amazed with the amount of change he's seen in just the past five. And that's fueled by things like artificial intelligence. It's machine learning capabilities. It's clear ag technology is driving changes in equipment today. In fact, I don't think we can quite comprehend how different the ag, ag space is going to look 10, 20, 30 years from now than what it looks today. Kubota is another company embracing the changing world of ag equipment. We need technology to harvest the data so we can make better decisions. If we can make better decisions, then the sustainability, I mean, doing more for less, we can start doing that. To find the labor usages, can we automate our equipment and or uh, use technology to make the best operator your everyday operator? And, and I think that's where we're, we're investing in. Todd Stuckey is president of Kubota Tractor Corporation, but also the chairman of AEM, which allows him to explore autonomy on a much broader scale. One thing that we need to do as an industry is make sure the regulation follows the technology. So we don't want to have an autonomous tractor that we have to have a person in it. So uh, those are the type of things that our industry must address. But the biggest hurdle for ag tech adoption in the coming years just may be commodity prices, with most major equipment manufacturers forecasting both equipment and technology sales to fall this year. The challenge we have is that technology investments in general, even in a declining commodity market, can pay for itself in one year. Daryl Matthews is a recently retired exec with Trimble. He says the greatest example of ROI may be with the most widely adopted technology today. Probably the best and most well-known technology is guidance and steering technology. It's at about 80% penetration, but it can pay $15 an acre on an average corn production uh, back to a farmer in less overlap, less fuel, uh, and less inputs. 
Technology as a tool is what will allow farmers to make more precise, real-time decisions, uncovering a future of smart farming like nothing we've ever seen. The impact is going to be very interesting for the next five years because we're just beginning to see the rapid adoption of that sensor technology, that optics technology, and seeing what that means for a farmer. Later in the show, we're going to also take you inside a robotic dairy, so stay tuned for that. All right, we need to take a quick break, and then your headlines for Ag Around the World is next. Smart Farming on U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by John Deere. For generations before and generations to come, John Deere is part of your farm and your family. Whatever your technology needs, John Deere has the tools to help grow your farm. And by ESN. Don't risk your nitrogen investment. ESN is designed to beat the five ROI killers and provide season-long end to your crop. Learn how ESN works at SmartNitrogen.com. Now for a look at agriculture around the globe. For the seventh straight month, global food prices continue to fall, but dairy prices increased. Last month, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations reports its food price index came in at 117.3 points. You see it here in red. That's the lowest level in three years. The agency says cereal prices saw a significant decline. That was driven by lower corn and wheat prices, while dairy prices rose more than 1% to a nine-month high, led by higher butter prices. The uptick was supported by increased import demand from Asian buyers and a seasonal decrease in milk production in Oceania. It's reported Russia has just sent its first pork exports to China since 2008. Russia is saying last week it had sent 27 metric tons of pork to China. It comes after Beijing lifted a ban on Russian pork due to African swine fever. Russia has transformed its pork market over the last two decades. Once fully dependent on imports, now it's self-sufficient. It exported about 255,000 tons of pork last year, a 66 percent increase over the previous year. We've been covering the ongoing protests in Europe, much of that roots from policy changes impacting agriculture there. But one ag company traveled the world to show the negative impacts of a world without cows. The European climate law states EU countries must cut greenhouse gas emissions by at least 55% by 2030, with the goal of being climate neutral by 2050. And some of that falling on agriculture, especially cattle. Alltech, an agricultural company based in the U.S., recently traveled the world to document the truths, all to showcase what the world would be like if we didn't have cows. I think the take-home message is that this is something that's nuanced, that the impact that we have through food production goes well beyond simply the calories that we produce. It is economic impact, it is rural communities, it is also the best ability we have to actually lower the impact we have on our environments. Alltech CEO Mark Lyons says the documentary is called World Without Cows and the biggest impact is showcasing conversations with people who the media don't have access to, as well as showing consumers the way their food is produced in a very balanced way. He says the documentary also hits home that agriculture is an innovative industry and so much positive can just come from a better conversation. Well, we mentioned it, pork exports are off to a solid start. So why is Mexico so important? We'll talk about it in Chip's Corner, coming up next. Chip's Corner on U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by Grounded. Spray smarter and improve herbicide performance with Grounded, a multifunctional adjuvant from Helena. Chip's Corner, the St. Patrick's Day weekend, a lot of good stuff to co cover. One piece of that good stuff, Chip. The pork exports, they've been explosive. Pork exports to Mexico reached 102,000 metric tons. That's up 6% from a year ago. The second largest on record, only trailing December 2023, Chip. Yeah, we'd like to talk about the developing markets in pork, and they are important. The Asian markets, Africa, Latin America, they're all very important. But hey, when it comes to pork exports, let's focus on number one, and that is Mexico. It's not China. It's Mexico. And Mexico, we talked with Dan Hallstrom for the CEO of the U.S. Meat Export Federation, and Dan is making it very clear, it, Mexico is, is a changing market for us. 
Honestly, the demand side didn't miss a beat. They just followed the market and uh, probably contributed greatly to increasing the market. So uh, yeah. so that that's the good news on hams. But honestly, Mexico is a much bigger story than just hams. <clears throat> We're starting to see, you know, some of the primal cuts. Loins, for example, are becoming a much bigger item down there. And quite frankly, we need all the help we can get on loins. Yeah. And, and then you got variety meats. So, you know, Mexico is one of those markets that's really on the pork side, taking, you know, almost the entire carcass. When we talk about an importing market that is taking the entire carcass, what we're talking about, Tyne, is an importing country that's competing with Joe Consumer in the meat case across the country. Uh, the, the, the competition for loins. Mexico for so long was just a ham buyer, but that's not the case anymore. They're, they're very interested in the entire carcass. That's the good news in the yeah. pork market. Not yeah. so good news what's happening here domestically. We covered in in the news block, but as you see consolidation taking hold in this market, we saw a, a, a pork processing plant close basically in your backyard, Chip, yeah. in Perry, yeah. Iowa. That announcement coming this week from Tyson. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's 9,000 hogs per day, about 2% of the daily kill. This is an important cog in the, the pork processing machine out there. It, as I as I talk with more and more participants in the hog industry, Tyne, it feels like this is something that was kind of planned. Like you said, it's part of the consolidation of the industry that is taking place. They know, they know where these hogs that right now are going into Perry, into Tyson and Perry, they know where they're going to go after June. So it's... It, it, it's it's not like it was a completely planned and structured play, but it's part of the industry. And and some would say that it's growth. Other would say that it's just consolidation of the industry. All right. Well, I'm sure we're going to continue to follow this. Yep. Chip Flory, host of Agritalk. Thanks so much. All right. When we come back, is there a new way to cash in on carbon? Our smart farming coverage continues next. Well, the chase to capture carbon isn't new in ag. In fact, carbon markets have sprouted into a new cash opportunity for farmers. But oftentimes, those programs require a farmer to change practices or introduce something new. As we continue our smart farming coverage this weekend, we explore a new way you could soon cash in on carbon. And it all ties back to the Inflation Reduction Act and something called 45Z. From his 7,000 acres of no-till crops to switching from synthetic fertilizer to now using regenerative or wastewater as plant food, Kelly Garrett is extremely carbon conscious. I believe in being collaborative with Mother Nature, not in competition. And this is, this is a collaborative effort. There's no doubt Kelly is a forward thinker. He says he was the first farm in the U.S. to sell carbon credits, and now he thinks there's a new opportunity for farmers to possibly cash in. I believe in five years, almost every product that we buy, especially food-wise, will have a CI score affixed to it. CI score stands for Carbon Intensity Score. He says now, with the 45Z tax credit that will go into effect January 1st of next year, your CI score will soon be worth even more, especially if your corn goes to an ethanol plant. It states that for every point an ethanol plant can get below 50 on their CI score, there's a two cent per gallon tax credit. The ethanol plants don't have a lot of hope of getting below 50, very far at least, without traceability of our product, of our corn. Kelly says by his calculation, for every point below the current average score of 29.1 in ag, it's worth two cents a gallon, or five and a half cents per bushel of corn. My score is a negative six because of the no-till, the cover crops, the regenerative things I do. So my score is 35 points below the average. If you take 35 times five and a half, that's $1.92 and a half per bushel. Seeing how crucial farmers' CI score will be to ethanol plants in the years ahead, Kelly saw a new opportunity for more than just himself. So he teamed up with Peter Meyer, Jared Creed, and Mike Busing to create regenerative roots solutions to educate all farmers. The four of us got together here in the last couple months and really trying to hone in on what the opportunities are for our network combined, uh, specifically geared towards these CPG programs and 45Z tax credit coming down the pipeline. 
Peter Meyer says a farmer's CI score is based on the GREET model, and an essential update to the model is expected soon from EPA. The GREET model here was just all for, for ethanol for cars, and now we're talking about a whole different uh, energy source and sustainable aviation fuel. And now with 45Z, the new tax credits for ethanol plants will also hinge on CI scores from farmers. What I'm advocating for is that this very much is a partnership with an ethanol plant. The tax credit is available to the ethanol plants, not to farmers, but the ethanol plant again doesn't have a lot of hope of gaining much of this tax credit without traceability to us. The ethanol business cannot survive without the farmer. And this has to be, as Kelly Garrett said earlier, this has to be a 50-50 partnership. The team's goal is to provide transparency and information to growers. But today, the biggest challenge is just how much misinformation is out there. Well, there's an incredible amount of skepticism with farmers, starting with the carbon market as a whole, things like that, government intervention. You know, I think farmers are eternally skeptical. And, you know, a lot of times we've been sold a bill of goods. Mike Busing has already taken a deep dive into the carbon markets. Through his company, Windy Ridge Ag, they handle the data collection for growers on current carbon programs available today. Over the last four years, um, we've brought a little over $10 million back to our grower base. So pretty, pretty incredible. And like, that's what we hope to do with regenerative roots. While those are one-year contracts, Busing says 45Z has the potential to be a longer-term steady revenue stream for farmers. Data is going to be the key piece of that. We would all love to just have our growers say, you know, walk in with a piece of paper, right, that says my CI scores 10, right, uh, pay, pay me for my grain. Uh, however, um, there will be a large data piece of this. It's going to have to go through third-party verification. A new opportunity for farmers to cash in. The team at Regenerative Roots doesn't see this as a fad. And it's all, again, in an effort to continue to find additional demand opportunities for the crop domestically with less dependency on the rest of the world. What we're advocating is for the farmer to be educated about what practices, what practices he or she can employ in order words, to reduce their uh, carbon intensity score, to make it a little bit more palatable for the GREET model, and thus end up with more money in their pockets at the end of the day. And the best part for Garrett? is he doesn't have to change any production practice on his farm or adopt something new to qualify. Well, like most things in life, this is luck for me. These are things I was already doing. Present day, I think there's a significant amount of producers that feel that their practices already have them ineligible, but again, the product offerings continue to expand that there's a special niche for every single operation out there. Meyer suggests farmers know how to calculate your CI score, but he says until the new GREAT model is released, there's no value in paying to verify that score just yet. You can learn more at regenerativerootssolutions.com. The address is on your screen. All right, when we come back, robots on the farm? It is nothing new for dairy, so we're off to our robotic dairy coming up next. Well, dairying is a lot of work, and it's a job that's 365 days a year. As we continue our smart farming coverage, Farm Journal's Michelle Rook looks into how smart farming is helping dairy operations reach new heights in productivity and efficiency. The United States dairy industry has long been a leader in technology and smart farming, and the latest chapter is robotics. Durham Goon Dairy added robots in 2021 as part of their third farm edition in South Dakota. Drum Goon East is home to 20 robots milking about 1,470 cows. Several factors pushed the Elliots to make the investment. Labor is becoming harder to come by, more expensive, and the, the willingness for people to stand and do some of the jobs that traditional and dairy farms probably less and less. Plus, when you remove the human element, cows can be milked more uniformly any time of day. So for me, the robot's about consistency. The robot does its job very well, very thorough, very consistent. It does the same job at the end of a 12-hour shift as it does at the start of a 12-hour shift. For the cows, a big advantage of a robotic system is milking is voluntary. So it's the cow's choice when she wants to go and get milked. We're not telling her. It's her choice when she wants to go. And when cows get milked in a quiet, stress-free environment three to four times a day at peak lactation, while eating an individually designed ration, production also increases. Here, every cow is identified as an individual, and to the degree they want to, they can feed them a certain amount of pellets. They can determine the number of times she can be milked in a day. The cows get milked very efficiently. Our cows are less than six minutes in the, in the box and there's their milk given, so they don't spend more. That's probably 18, 20 minutes of their day. The rest of their day, they can eat. 
use the brushes, lay in their sand beds and have, have, have comfort. So we will have more milk and I think our cows will last longer. At Drumgoon, they've also added automation in areas outside the milking parlour. Robots pushing up the feed, uh, automatic scraper scraping the manure. We tried to use as much automation in this barn as we can. In Wisconsin, Pagel's Ponderosa Dairy and Hilltop Farmer are also using smart farming technology, including for heat detection. A system built by Parlor Boss and Sense Hub worked together in the rotary to identify cows coming into heat while they're milking. So if you look at the TV screen uh, above, for example, uh, this might show us if a cow is due for vaccination today or if a cow is due to be inseminated today because she's a heat. That information will be there. That's taken headlock time from five to six hours a day down to just four to five hours per week. Out in the barn, temperature control systems also help optimize temperature, keep cows cool, and fly free. Smart farming technology that's all in the name of cow comfort, efficiency, and productivity. I'm Michelle Brook for U.S. Farm Report. Well, that does it for U.S. Farm Report. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to tune in again next weekend as we work to build on our tradition. Have a great weekend, everyone. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast.